Okay, we are now recording. Okay, hello everybody. Welcome to this November 8th meeting of the Amherst Energy and Climate Action Committee. Um, we have some fun things to talk about today, I hope. Um, but the first thing on the agenda, well, first we have to figure out who's the note taker. Who's today's note taker? Who was it last time? It was Laura Drocker last time. Because uh, Laura was near a computer. So um, Jesse would be next, but I think Jesse has done it sometime recently. So Jesse done, I'm not sure whose turn it is. So we skipped around last time because uh, Laura was happened to be near a computer. It was easy for her to take notes. So who wants to do it this time? Any takers? Or should we just continue down the list? All right, then Jesse would be the next person. Jesse, you okay with that? Yeah, of course. We'll pick up from where we were, although I'm not, I haven't been keeping track, but it seems to me you've done it fairly recently. I thought I had, but it's it's okay. quite all right. All right, thank you for being quiet. gracious about that. Uh, okay, so first thing is always to review and vote on the minutes. I can share them, I have them up here, um, but are there any comments, any corrections? ECAC minutes <clears throat> there. It's a little bigger. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> um, comments or corrections. I have a suggestion in this section that's um, summarizing what I presented, the Mass Audubon Report, and it'd be the second to last dash that starts out, Roof suggested that the solar bylaw consider how the town would encourage solar development on the parcels that are graded straight A's across six categories. We perhaps should mention that that's referring to the grading system in the um d-o-e-r solar uh, technical potential of solar study we are i got it that's, that's where that grading system is presented so that that's what i was referring to in that comment like that right it, it was yep. it was not in the audubon report which is so that's why it would be useful <laughs> label that right good 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 fix anything else i like the woohoo very good <laughs> <laughs> i know i left it in <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting that the um towns that have had trouble getting it passed all seem to have the same problem of people inside they didn't do their due diligence they didn't do what jesse did and stephanie did and talk to people beforehand and make sure they had the, the building inspector on you know on board and that sort of thing that seems to be the one common denominator for the few towns that have not passed it many more have than haven't in so far as it's come up According to the um, webinar today, it looked like only 20 communities had adopted a specialized code, but uh, and some of them being major cities yep. like, you know, Boston, Worcester. Um, but I suspect that number is probably more now. It's, it's a little higher. There have been two or three in the last week, and I don't think 20 includes us because I think it was 21 the week that we added our names to it. So it's, it's still okay. in, the, in the mid 20s, low to mid 20s. Mm -hmm. um, if assuming that uh, you know, zero carbon man, DEA are, are counting correctly. <laughs> but it is some big towns on that list. Mm -hmm. So yep. it was more than 25% of the population of the state the last time I checked. That was before Worcester. So it's probably more than that now. <laughs> All right, so if there's no other comments, does somebody want to 
Can you close this out, Lori? So yes. everyone's Stop on screen. Sure. Thank you. I will move to accept the minutes with that slight edit. Looks like Dwayne has seconded. Oh, you need to. Uh, did you say that verbally, I, Dwayne? I did. I, I, I second I Steve Ruth's motion. Why I saw the I hand and the mouth move, but I didn't actually hear you. We so didn't hear you. Yeah. OK, <laughs> just making sure. Um, all right, then uh, via voice vote in no particular order. Allison. Stain. Goldner. Yes. Breger. Yes. Roof. Yes. Selman. Yes. Drucker. Yeah. D. Yes. <clears throat> Minutes are approved. Thank you. Cool. I thought you were raising your hand, Jesse. It took me a minute to realize what was going on there. <laughs> Official tally. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> All right, so next we have one attendee and I believe public comment comes next. So let's see who is our attendee. Martha. Hi, Martha. Do you have anything for us today? Uh, no, thanks. Just hello. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, <clears throat> so updates. I think. Uh, we heard some of this last week, but why don't we go ahead and do updates next then, um, Dwayne? Um, I can really only update on the uh, Solar Bylaw Working Group. Um, we have our anticipated final meeting tomorrow. Um, um, just for those who might be interested, 12 o'clock to, to uh, 3 o'clock. Uh, um, where we're going to try to, um, and the goal is to um, finalize our read through and, and approval as a working group of the draft bylaw, uh, and then review sort of the next steps moving forward in terms of um, tr um, transmitting that bylaw to the uh, to the town uh, and, and and how that all goes forward, along with some other deliverables that are required um in our charge uh which um are pretty much put together and and uh hats off to stephanie and to uh christine bestrup for their work um on um uh some of these deliver deliverables uh and the and the drafting of the uh, bylaw that we are all um contributing to and reviewing um so that's that's the uh the goal uh of the meeting tomorrow um, and uh, hopefully report out next time that that's done. Um, so next time that means there will be a draft for us to review. Is that correct? Well, I'm not, I, I defer to Stephanie maybe on that in terms of the process. We will, as a commit by law, I mean, sorry, a working group, um, come to a consensus and approval uh, to move forward the draft, uh, exactly how it gets bundled up and then provided uh, to the town, uh, which is who we provide it to, and then it becomes public, obviously, uh, including this committee. Um, uh, and and it, it, I'll defer to Stephanie on that process. Yes, like, it, yeah, it's likely to be going to, um, it'll go to the council and likely be referred to the CRC, and the CRC, it will also be referred to the planning board. So the planning board will also take a look at it. Um, and in the meantime, in a sort of parallel track, it will go to um, some specific staff and department heads for review. Um, well, I probably will send it to all of the department heads actually. Um, so it'll have an opportunity to be reviewed by department heads and um, comments would then funnel through the CRC. So it won't be coming back to the solar bylaw working group at this point you know it'll be taken that process will be taken over by a council committee subcommittee a co well the council and the subcommittee of the council so at what point does ecac have a close look and discuss and make comments so my 
I would say that the most appropriate time would be when it goes before the CRC and when it gets referred to the planning board, you know, that might be a good time to um, provide comment because your co any edits that are going to happen at this point now, other than what staff, you know, because when staff does theirs, again, they will be forwarded to the council um, or to the CRC. So any comments at that point and edit, suggested edits will happen through that pathway. Okay, so it'll go to the council and be refer and that point it becomes public record, no doubt, because it'll well, it's probably already it already is going to be public record yeah. record as soon um, as we're done. Okay, so then then it'll go to the council. The council will funnel it to the CRC, but it sounds like we should at any point once it has gone, once it gets referred to the CRC from the council, it sounds like that's when we should start looking at it. Is that what yeah. I understood? Yes, that's what I'm saying. Is like okay. you want to, you know. Uh, at the point, and you know, remember that we've just had an election, although we do have several incumbents, but um, it might be a little, you know, there's going to be new makeup of committees. So, you know, things, it might take a little while before um, they even start addressing, you know, addressing the solar bylaw. Like I would say, you know, earliest, maybe February, and that would be the earliest. But so and you have time. No reason that ECAC can't start um, no, reviewing no it and thinking about you it can... and, and putting ideas together. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You certainly can. Um, but I mean, in keeping in mind that, you know, it, it, similar to the process now, it will be going through edits and changes with each, you know, kind of yeah. review. Although it won't be, I don't believe it will be as lengthy a process. Um, the solar bylaw working group did a lot of vetting, so I don't anticipate it'll be quite as long, but I don't, I don't know. Jesse, you hand up? Yeah. Sorry. Well, I was going to actually ask Dwayne, um, if you can think of a way to, to kind of curate the ECAC process so that we're not taking up um, time from the CRC kind of, it, we're not asking people to explore things that you guys have already thought about. I think, right, you, so your group's already thought this through quite quite a bit. I don't know if there's a way that you can help us be efficient with our time. Uh, maybe we all read it and ask you our questions first and then you say, don't bother asking the CRC, that's never gonna happen or that kind of thing. I, I think, cause they are gonna be. Um, I mean, I. I can do whatever <laughs> yeah exactly and it's a pretty lengthy document so uh, and there's a lot in there that's probably um interesting but not worth spending too much time on and there's other parts that are probably more of interest um i mean what i would be happy and, and sort of plan to do would be to provide some sort of um framework and summary at an ecac meeting um if called upon um uh to to provide you know sort of the context and the review view of the of the uh, of the uh, working group and then and then sort of the the main components of the of the bylaw um some of our um goals and objectives and and limitations and what we heard from the the legal counsel and so forth that sort of guide our guided our work uh, and then, um, you know, give an overview of kind of the main sections uh, and then maybe hone in a little bit on the sections that um, were um, were uh, were, for, uh, were discussed in some detail uh, by the working group and kind of where and how and why we settled where we did um, and um, uh, areas where there's there's um, only sort of one area where there was some some. Uh, really differences of opinion, I would say. Um, and um, and then um, help to answer questions or or um, think about how ECAC might want to um, respond to this and and um, and make comments on it. Okay, uh, Steve. Yeah. I was um, Steve. Steve was there for most of it too, <laughs> as a witness. <laughs> um, I'm looking at the next steps and approval 
process document, I think, that was in the Solar Bylaw Working Group um, meeting packet for tomorrow, and it outlines those dates nicely. But ECAC is not mentioned at all in there. Are, are we going to get like a formal request from town council or no, someone um, to get to provide feedback? And I, my answer is I, I, I hope we are asked in a formal way to provide feedback. Um, I would be disappointed if we were not asked. Well, I don't, I think you have been, you guys have all, I mean, Steve, you've been at most of the meetings that I know you're, you sort of have, you've represented your own personal views and then sometimes those of the committee. So you all have been involved because you were involved in the assessment. You've been part of that. That was in the charge. Right. So you have been part of it. If you want to, I think, um, I don't know that there will be sort of a formal coming to you. I, I, I don't need think it needs to be that formal. You've been weighing in as you've been going along. Um, so I would say that it will come, you know, you will have an opportunity and I would certainly encourage uh, you all to have an opportunity to take a look, but I don't think it's going to be a for formal asking because you are already part of the charge of the solar bylaw working group. You were referenced in that charge. Yeah. So you've already had a formal kind of, role if you will what i would hope is being being our committee i would hope that the town would turn to us and say here's the draft bylaw please give us your opinion on the draft bylaw i know we've been involved in earlier stages and i've been involved as a citizen that's different i would like the town to recognize the importance of the ecac and ask us to render uh, an opinion and suggestions on the draft bylaw if, if they don't ask us fast then why do we exist well, I don't, I can think I, that's... Can I, can I, can I take ahead, that for Lauren. a second? When we first, when they first put together the solar bylaw working group, we had requested two spots on the working group and got one, but that was where our input came from. Our input has been coming all along through Dwayne. So I'm not actually as concerned as you are, Steve, about not having a formal request. I think we should review it and we should write a memo if we feel we need to do that. But I don't feel like because we were explicitly included, even if, though it wasn't as much as we would have liked to have been, uh, I feel like that we have been funneling, you know, Steve, you, you as a citizen and and as a Dwayne, citizen, as a member of it, and, and Dwayne as a member of it have been funneling the ECAC's, you know, thoughts on this through to the committee the whole time as part of the bylaw working group, right? So. Um, it would be nice. I, I would agree. You know, I would not be uh, I would I would not be upset if somebody asked us, but I wouldn't be particularly disappointed if they didn't only because we are in there. So. So um, I have my hand up, I guess I can go. Um, I hear you, Lori. I also agree with Steve. Um, I think if we're an advisory committee, we should be advised on things that are related to climate and that the council that may not have as much expertise on. With that said, this is a unique situation where they did form a working group that did include an ECAC member. So I can see both sides. But in general, it feels like if we're meant to be an advisory committee, we should be advising on things like this. Um, that's a larger in my mind, that's a larger thing that I would hope we could figure out how to sort out. Um, but I do think that particularly related, maybe not to, um, but I really like Jesse's suggestion and I would second the um, idea that maybe Dwayne gives us a little bit of an overview when it when it's final. And then I think we can decide at that point what input to give. Um, but if any counselors are listening and want to ask our advice explicitly, I would not be. Um, that's what I was thinking and appreciate that. And I, you know, obviously I was to some extent representing ECAC, but I, you know, my, my role there was not necessary to, um, try to represent our collective opinions, which I cannot do. Um, uh, and so, um, while it was, uh, had some presence, of ECAC, it was not, you know, I'm, I'm, they should not suspect or, or anticipate that um, the full bylaw has been reviewed and, and agreed upon by ECAC in, in any way. I don't think that was the intent. Um, I think the issue maybe from uh, that Stephanie is that, you know, we're, we're a volunteer commission uh, 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 advisory committee. 
um, and not so much in the normal chain of commands of of um, from providing comments and so forth. Um, you know, I think I think to the extent, obviously, we can and we probably want to as ECAC provide some comments to the town council, uh, whether asked or not. And I, I think most likely we'll want to do that. Um, if there was a desire to, um, you know, have more of a formal request uh, and sort of have that on the record and then respond to that with our comments, um, that, that sounds good. Um, and, and some advantages to that, I think it would be a matter of working, you know, uh, and, and, and maybe ECAC can either individually or um, we can represent, if we all agree, we can rep, we can ask our, our local council counselors to uh, make, you know, provide, ask the council to make that request. I, I think when the CRC is formed, I mean, part of this is also that yeah. the CRC, <laughs> we don't know what the makeup of that group is going to be yet. Um, and I, I, I guess my feeling is, um, and, and I, and I certainly hear you, Steve and Laura about weighing in. I just, I wouldn't want it always to have to be a formal invitation. I would hope that as things happen in town, y'all are going to weigh in, you know, and not wait for the invitation, but just make yourselves <laughs> vocal and known. Right. So, I, and I hear you. I just like, that's why, that's why <laughs> um, you were written into the charge. Right. You know, the, yeah. I mean, no, I think that was part of it. Is do we always know what the council's talking about? Like, it, it, proactive versus right. reactive. I think that's the, and, the question. Yeah. And we need both of them. Like, it'd be helpful to have it come on both sides. And then we, you know, I yeah. think that's the point. Yeah, I hear you. I, I hear you. I just, um, again, I think it's just like when the CRC finally convenes, you know, is a time that, you know, I could reach out and yeah, you know, at the point that it gets refer it gets sent to the planning board, maybe I mean, but there, you know, it's getting referred to planning board is because they're the entity that reviews this legislation, you right? So yeah. that's part of why it officially goes to them. So I, I I'll just jump in and say too, I also philosophically I I think I agree and politically I agree. I also think if we're going to spend time on anything on this topic, we should spend time on reviewing the, the bylaw. And so when the CRC does reconvene as a new group, we've got a concise, clear, well thought through unanimous ECAC opinion to give them. I think that's more important than whether they ask us or not, though I do appreciate very much that that notion of we, you know, I, I would I would prefer to be on the list with the CRC and the planning board and the ECAC, I think that's good. I also think they're gonna be very receptive to whatever we put out um, and with limited time, I'd rather think about the words in the bylaw than whether I was asked to think about them. Yeah, yeah you'll get the draft that go that this final solar bylaw working group draft, as soon as it's done, I mean, in, on my agenda is to put it in your next packet, you know? Right. So when it's done, it'll be in your meeting packet and you can go from there with that draft. So oh. that's what I would recommend. Okay, so let's put on the agenda next time then to start this conversation with an overview from Duane. Assuming, assuming the final version from the committee is in, or the draft version from the committee from the Solar Bylaw Working Group is in our packet. Uh, Duane, will you give us a overview exactly as you described next time? Our, Absolutely. Our next, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm not sure when the next one is because of Thanksgiving, but yeah, yeah, the next meeting is scheduled to be the Wednesday right in front of Thanksgiving. Oh, oh, I, I won't do it then. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, what do we do? Do we do? Do we just skip that meeting then, or do we? Uh, I would recommend we, it. Huh? We do I would that. Recommend it. Yeah. Then, then yeah, our next meeting is not until December. Uh, that's probably okay as long as we dive right in, right? because then we're going to not have a lot of chance. So, so the new board, I assume, goes in, the new committee, town council goes in in January 1 or something like that. So uh, then the new planning board. Actually, right? might be December. It might be December, actually. I'm not sure. I have to double check. If it's December, I wonder if we shouldn't uh, offset our meetings, just bring them forward a week to the week after Thanksgiving, if we, if we jog them by. Oh, 
that work or not? Our next scheduled meeting is December 6. I, I, I mean, okay. I, what's your concern with when the council convenes? Because I guess that's okay. Not it's not going to happen. Meetings. Nothing is going to happen for a while. <laughs> Yeah, they, okay. you right. know, it's going to take right. them time, <clears throat> and I don't even know when they'll get to the bylaw. I'm, I'm thinking bylaw. ahead a little because it always gets crazy around the break, right? So we'll have a meeting on December 6th. We'll have another one around December 20th then. Is that right? Yeah, the 20th yep. would be the next one. Then we probably have one right after New Year's, and then I'm gone for two weeks. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's about the time we're going to want to be formulating the response. So I'll miss at least one meeting in January. I think just one meeting in January. So sometime by early February, we want to make sure we have a response, right? That's sort of what we're aiming for here. Yeah. And again, there's no guarantee that they're even, you know, how they're even going to be entertaining that as an item right. quite yet, just, but just, it doesn't matter. Better for you to be prepared okay. and have a goal. All right. So let, let's have that as a goal then to have something done in January, or early February, in the way of uh, either just a memo saying, gee, this is great, we support it, or specific suggestions, just something so that ECAC's collective voice is heard in this process. Okay. Okay, all right. Uh, I think I'm next on the agenda, is that right? Yes. Is there anything else on the uh, solar bylaw working group? We go on on the solar update. Mm -hmm. not, not for me. I don't have much with heat pumps. I think we're still waiting waiting for the RFP. I'm still continuing. I'm just finishing. I still haven't finished the last. Uh, I'm taking this heat pump coach training. I finished three of the four units. The fourth unit, they rescheduled to a time I couldn't make. So I'm still waiting. Last, I, last time I looked, they hadn't posted it yet. As soon as they post the materials and I have time, I will do that last training and will officially be a heat pump coach or electrification coach. Um, but the RFP on heat pumps is what this update is supposed to be about. And I don't think we have much there yet, right? Stephanie, are we still waiting on I'll that? Yeah, I'll I'll cover that in my okay, my updates. Okay, so then let's let's talk about that later. Uh, going on then. Um, <clears throat> okay, I have uh, a community climate bank update. Oh, can I just uh, make because yep. um, I think it fits into the heat pump thing. Go ahead. Um, and, and Stephanie, you're probably aware, but Mass CC did come out with a request for information um, with regard to um, neighborhood electrification. Oh yeah, um, which um, I think normally would involve uh, heat pumps, be them air sourced or ground sourced heat pumps at a neighborhood level. Uh, I haven't dug into a detail. It's not a request for proposal, but it's a request for information and can uh, kind of help guide where Mass EC goes with regard to this um, um, program that they're probably put some funding behind. Uh, so I thought I'd just mention that for um, anyone individually yeah. or or um, collectively that we want to um, take a look at that or if, or if uh, the town wants to. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I saw that, that, Dwayne, and I actually okay. clicked on the link and start, started to try to fill it out and realize it was asking about community stuff that I didn't really know. So Stephanie, that seems to me something that maybe maybe you should fill out or the two of us should fill out or something like that. Yep. Um, but it seems like something that's too good to pass up, right? That they're asking for input on street by street electrification, right? Replacing wholesale replacement of gas pipelines with uh, with heat pumps and electrification. Yeah, that and that was one of the limitations. It seemed like, and I'm not sure if it's because the gas companies are paying for it or something, but um, it, it seemed to be focused on replacing, you know, street by street or neighborhood um, level. Uh, for gas, um, it struck me as being, um, you know, why not do this for oil heated streets too? Uh, that even seems more important um, in some ways. But, um, you know, obviously we don't have new gas in Amherst, but we have plenty of gas um, in parts of, of town, I, I would imagine. Did everybody see that? If not, I'll forward it right now. Did you see that, Stephanie? Um, I think I did. And I think I opened it quickly, but didn't do a dive so 
I'll, I can send it again to everyone. I just got, I got it through someone named Sally Pick at Crocker.com. Yeah, I know Sally. Um, SJP. I don't think I got it directly from Mass CEC. Oh, no, it's, oh, no, it came from Zero Carbon Mass, so I did get it directly. Um, uh, or through her. She went through her to Zero Carbon Mass. So I can I can send copies of that to everyone too. Um, all right. But Stephanie, maybe that's something for us to talk about when we meet. Um, maybe we can, if you haven't already done it by then, maybe I can help with that. Yep. Um, yeah. And I don't. Yeah, I don't know. We'll we'll just talk offline yep. later. Uh, thank you for that, Dwayne. I'd forgotten all about that. Uh, okay. So let's see. Uh, next thing on the agenda was a community climate bank update. So the, the saga continues. So I put in a call to uh, Maura Healy's office about two weeks ago now, I guess it was, uh, to try to find out what the heck the climate bank is. Because if you look it up online, all links lead to this webinar given by Maura Healy on announcing the new climate bank. And that's pretty much all you can find. Um, there are some generic forms from mass housing and this sort of thing to fill out for information, but it's not for information about the climate bank, it's just for information. <laughs> so so um, I called the governor's office to ask, who do I call? And I got sent around in a big circle back to mass housing, but they gave me one other contact um, well, one of them was with uh, the some some office of climate response and mitigation or something like that. It had a fancy name. It sounded like some new office that she put in place. And the phone number sent me right back to the governor's main line again. So, <laughs> but they gave me one other number, which was for mass development, and I called that and got um, a person by the name of Connor Glasheen. After a couple of pass, got passed around a little bit who didn't know anything about the climate bank, but he was in charge of the PACE program and knew all about that. And so I said, oh, well, we're interested in that too, because we understand that it's being renovated, that it's still under, under uh, the rules are still being changed. He said, oh, no, no, we fixed all the rules now and we have, we're having a webinar about it in uh, about a half hour. And that's when I sent, I sent a little broadcast out to ECAC just to see if anybody could watch the webinar. I, don't, I think uh, Stephanie made the last 25 minutes of it and hopefully they'll record it so we can watch it. Um, uh, and in the end, I did get a number for somebody, a uh, number and an email of somebody who is supposed to know about the, the climate bank. So <laughs> I'm still trying to figure out if there is a program, if there's a there there. Uh, as far as I can tell so far, there, there isn't, but maybe something is in the works. So I'll keep following that up. And Laura, when I do, I'll write a little memo. Uh, I hope to get an answer in the next few days. Um, I've just been following that thread, seeing what I can find. And uh, I do want to get back to the council, but as uh, it's been pointed out, the council's changing now anyway, so there's no real hurry. Um, but we should clarify what we meant by climate bank, considering it turns out we didn't actually quite know yet either. <laughs> so, um, all right, and that's where that is. So that's my update there. I don't have anything more solid than that to say. Laura's got her hand up. Uh, Laura, go ahead. Yeah, so, <clears throat> Um, again, sorry that I didn't follow this thread when we were writing the report because I would have never suggested that we include a goal to set up a climate bank. That was not my intention of sharing that article. Um, however, I also don't think there's no there there, although I understand your frustration. Um, the climate chief did just publish October 25th, a very detailed report on sort of the whole of state strategy for climate. I can't say I've been able to read it all yet, but there does there are several mentions of the climate bank in here. And maybe I can just share my screen quickly and show this one um part. Yeah, here we Please, go. Yes. Um so you know I think this is something we should probably review and see what's relevant to us this whole document. Um, but here you go. Like, this is what I was trying to get at kind of, um, 
you know, again, we really need to make sure that we're not leaving any money on the table with yeah. all of the federal tax credits and direct payments that are going to be available through the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, and so this, you know, they're talking about this clearinghouse, um, the climate bank, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't think they've figured out the full mechanism yet, which is clear from your conversations, Lori. Um, but I think the point being, if we do want to edit that goal, I think the goal we want to make is that we want to make sure the town of Amherst is participating as fully as possible in the funding opportunities, and not just the town of Amherst, residents of Amherst, right, um, are participating as fully as possible in all of the funding opportunities, which, as it says, are unlimited to make sure that we are maximizing clean energy development. Um, so that's, I think, more the point I would make to the council is not specifically the Green Bank, but rather, you know, the town man giving a town manager goal specific to that. Yep, I, and I agree with you. I just want to make sure if, if you know, I want to make sure I understand, uh, follow up on the climate bank specifically since they asked about it. But I agree well, I think with you we about. Just send them the, I don't think you need to do all that work. I think we send them the articles about the climate bank. Well, but I think it's good for us to know because if there is money there, I mean, I'm still following this thread. There, there is apparently somebody who knows about this, so it would not be nice to know what they know. You know, is there money available? How do we access it? That's all. You know, if we're not, if we're talking about not leaving money on the table, and Stephanie and then Dwayne. Yeah, I think I've been I've said this before, but with all of the IRA funding, I think, you know, we keep getting told there's money, there's money, there's money. And there's been no, <laughs> no clear path, no, no understanding of where, when it's coming, how it's coming. And it's not just us. I, I my colleagues and other communities are spinning as well, like, where, who is going to get us this information? So from my part, I would appreciate additional eyes on knowing when these things are happening because I'm not clear I'm always getting information. And mostly I've been feeling like I've been, it's very anxiety inducing, I have to tell you, because you feel like, am I missing something? Did I just miss something? And, you know, and I feel like there's just been no real sort of clearing house of here is the place you go to find the information, which is really what we need. Um, so anyway, that's just to say that I really appreciate all your additional eyes. And yes, please feel free to send things to me. Hang on a moment. I'm sorry, my, my dog is disassembling my laundry. I have to go pull him out of the laundry <laughs> basket. I'll be right back. I'll, I'll take, put my hand down because I, I just had the same comment Stephanie had um, that I, 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 that. I strongly believe there is a there there. It's just not there yet uh, yeah we're and, saying and, and we're seeing the same thing in our industry as well it's like green this 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 it's like i i have yet to see a single dime manifest yeah but i wouldn't give as well i mean i think we can reiterate that to the town council and the town manager you know um but there's also things like the projects we've just finished like the like the north library like making sure that if there's extra credits available, we should be getting those. Maybe we should make a point of of just asking, you know, what what big projects are going on in the town right now, and can we get somebody to? Because I don't know anything about the library project, for example, and I know that's been a big deal in the town. I have not been tracking that at all. Uh, maybe we should just have somebody report on what's going on there and to the extent we can start try to advise them on where they might look for money for you know green upgrades green yeah I, don't I, know, I have no clue about how that's working right I will say with the live with the well at least with the school project and yeah. I think it's really true with the library too um, that they have been pretty connected and you know with funding opportunities, at least the school I know. Um, and I, I think that's true for the library as well, but I'm not 100% on that. But I think they've had some people sort of working with them and advising them too. Yeah, I think that's true for the li Jones Library and the school. I think yeah. for the North Library, we need to go back. We need to go back yeah. and double check. And probably the same for this, the solar 
at the golf course um, because I feel like there's been some additional credits. What was the other um, library? The, the North Amherst Library. The North Amherst one. Does it have a name? I think I heard you just call it something. North Amherst? Yeah, yeah the solar at, at the golf course is not, it's a third party. Um, and also we're not, um, we're, we're not an off taker at all for the electricity at that site. So just as an FYI. That's not really ours to worry about, but the North Amherst library, if there's a project coming up there, maybe we should, is there somebody I can contact? It's already done. Like it's almost about to open, oh, but okay. it had a lot of clean energy, not solar, I don't think, but it, you know, it has, I think it's a heat pump run facility. Like I think that we can go back and claim money on that project, but since it's it's done, like I don't think there's a developer there that we can like ping to say, go figure this out. But maybe I'm wrong. Um, but yeah, looking back, I think we need to figure out like looking back if we could if there's money that we could could can get apply there. for. Yeah, if there's a tax credit or something they're eligible for. Hmm. Okay. Uh, is there somebody we should ask to come talk about that project, or how do we how do we get started doing something like that? I don't think there's anything for us to do. I just think the town needs to be aware, which is uh, they are because Stephanie is, but like okay. I think being short sighted without having a financial director, you know, I think it makes yeah sense. right right right. Sorry. Okay. Yes, I was going to say um, if Sean Mangano were here, mm -hmm. he'd he'd be there. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I'm missing him more and more every day. So there may not be much we can do about that one way or the other. Um, is there is there a role for ECAC there or not? Sounds like sounds like no. I mean, I I, I just uh, you know um, going backwards. I you know I don't know. I mean, if there's potential funding opportunities, I you know. I don't know, sometimes projects, I mean, even with, you know, some of the, that draft policy that Jeremiah and I put together, I think I reported out to you all that, you know, there was a, um, a boiler replacement that happened. It was a small one. It was just yeah. for like a little pump station, but, um, you know, again, it was something that happened even after we internally yeah. said, <laughs> you know, created this policy, sent it out to everyone. Um, so I think things do slip through the cracks and, um, how to stay wholly on top of that. I mean, we struggle with it here internally. So as a committee, I think that's going to be even harder, but open and willing to anything. So yeah, and that's why I'm suggesting it as a town manager goal because then the town manager needs to report on progress towards it. And that progress may just be that nobody's telling us where the money is so we can't figure it out yet. And that's mm -hmm. that may be the progress. But the idea of having it as a goal means that hopefully it'll, I think, a better chance of maybe not slipping through the cracks. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. My my brilliant idea is that I think like the like the surrounding town should hire a contractor whose job is just to like look at all the projects we've done over the past however whenever the IRA got grandfathered in and like make sure there's no money sitting on the table that we could get. But and just apply for because we've already yeah. yeah. But again, like mm -hmm. to Dwayne's and Stephanie's point, I don't, and J Jesse's, like I think we're still a little premature for some of that. Yeah. Okay, so if there's nothing else on this topic, let's go on to the next, which is interesting. So this is the next topic on the list is the, you know, what can we do to um help support solar in the built environment. Uh, we just started talking last time about maybe running a webinar series like we did for heat pumps and EVs. And you know, we did a bunch of different things last year that were pretty well received and that got a few hundred, uh, a few hundred views on YouTube, I think, on the town YouTube channel each, um, or a couple hundred. So I was thinking, you know, is it is it time to do another series like that in the way of outreach around uh, solar in the built environment? And if so, 
what do we want to do and who's going to take responsibility for finding someone to give a webinar and one idea was was to have folks who have solar of course on their house already do a panel discussion or who have bought into a solar farm or you know whatever and uh, another idea is just to get the options out there because i know a lot of us including me are pretty confused about what the options are and to somehow work in this problem of trees getting taken down to put solar in there was a suggestion of a research project last time that I'm seriously considering of taking up with some undergrads next year if no one else does it. So <laughs> trying to figure out, you know, how just how many trees are, are being taken out to put in solar on people's houses and whether or not it's really a good trade. Um, or how it affects the efficacy of the solar and removing carbon. Um, ideas, <laughs> questions, what, yeah, go ahead, Steve. When, when you say built environment, are you thinking sort of residential scale or are you thinking more commercial scale? Both, or both? either or, I think. I think it's separate audiences, but um, as a homeowner, I'd sure like to know uh, what I can do and the way, what my options are. But I think that, you know, when we talk about the built environment, it's a little funny, right? Because we don't want to, we, we all want to also include people who don't have a roof they can put solar on, but somehow want to be involved in solar. So maybe built environment isn't quite the right way to think of it, but how homeowners and business owners can participate in a way that makes sense. Um, I maybe, think and, targeting and for, for homeowners. Yeah, home, homeowners and business owners, like people who, who home, well, homeowners, business owners, and also renters, people who want to be involved somehow in yep. solar. Yeah, I mean, if it's a, if it's a um... If it's not on, if it's not on your roof, and it's, you're talking more about an off-taking agreement, that that often gets into building solar in the not built environment. And maybe we should uh, stay away from that. If we stay away from that, though, how do we? Yeah, you're right, and I hadn't thought about that till just now, right? But if we just talk about the built environment, then we're talking about homeowners, and we're excluding a large fraction of our. I, I mean, one thing we could. I mean, one thing. It's commercial, it's churches, it's nonprofits. I mean, there's a lot, it's warehouses, it's stores, exactly. you know. Exactly, yeah. Back in lots. Yeah, yeah. I mean, one thing, and I'm not sure if we can do it, but maybe there's a student we can find to do it. Or maybe, you know, Stephanie's done some of this for the municipal built environment, the uh, but they're municipally owned, municipal. municipally owned buildings. Uh, but obviously there's a lot more. Uh, but if you take out the colleges and the university, um, cause they do their own thing. Um, you know, there, there could, you know, we could think about finding a student project, um, just, to itemize, <laughs> it wouldn't be that, you know, there's not, it's not that big of a town in terms of commercial buildings to itemize sort of what the, what the, uh, what the prospects are for, solar on the non-residential built environment. Okay, so on the non-residential, the municipal and commercial, is that what you're thinking? Or just commercial? Well, I, I think Stephanie has a good handle on the municipal Okay. Uh, already. Okay, so that's how we would include not homeowners, people who are interested just generally in the in the topic. Okay, that, that makes sense. And then we can avoid the the sometimes touchy subject of uh, you know buying into large arrays that would have to be built somewhere. Yeah, I guess I mean there's always uh, for the commercial, uh, and I would include in that sort of um, nonprofits and faith organizations and so forth. Um, I'm not sure if there's a good way to reach out to them um, in some way that's not that's. Uh, um, it's an overly time consuming. You know, if we did, if we did some sort of study, then we would want to outreach it <laughs> to, to people who know, need to hear about it. Go ahead, Steve. I guess I was thinking along the lines of uh, um, webinars for residents on how, how to take advantage of solar. And maybe there's two or three different webinars. One could be for, for homeowners, a webinar on a session on how to get solar on your rooftop. What are the options? Another could be for people who aren't 
homeowners who don't have a, their own roof. And that could be, how do you get involved with community solar? Um, and then perhaps a third might be more targeted towards the, the business, the small businesses and nonprofits like churches. Here's how you can get involved in solar, either on your roofs or through community solar. <clears throat> and that, so there'll be like three different sessions, each fairly specific to the needs of that, that group of people. I, I think I like that idea. Um, understanding that the non-homeowners one is not really gonna be just about the built environment, but. Right. I, I do think I like that idea. Um, then, because it's not we're not it's not like we're advocating for putting community solar in a particular place. It's just there are these projects going in. What does it mean to get involved? How does it you know what what benefits do you get? Uh, what sort of projects are there out there that you might or might not be interested in? Um, what were the three the, the nonprofits homeowners? What was the third? Sorry. Community solar. Okay. So homeowner homeowners who have, have a roof that they could potentially put it on, <coughs> residents who would don't have a roof that would go that are interested in the community solar route, and then nonprofits and local mm -hmm. businesses. Yeah. And I think we could do some outreach to the business community. I mean, I could use what contacts I have to, you know, bring a couple of couple of different organizations in. I'm sure everybody here has some contact with a church group or a nonprofit group that might be interested. Um, I guess the, 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 and just on, on that, um, I mean, mo when I think about businesses, maybe the, the faith organizations are different, but most businesses, I'm just thinking about in town, um, uh, they don't own their buildings. Um, so maybe it's, you know, for, for those type of buildings, maybe it's more the building owner audience um, is what we might might want to reach out to in a, in a webinar uh, or direct con contact. Yeah. yeah, that's a good point. Is it allowed that we could have um, someone from a solar company come and give the ins and outs for, for residents who have rooftops? Because they're the ones that are going to know all the details and and um, you know, the timeframes and the, and the incentives and that sort of thing. Yeah, we did that with heat pumps, right? Yeah, um, you, we had, and we just it, we had um, Scott Chernak came with somebody else, I think, and gave a talk that wasn't focused on his business, but just focused right. on heat pumps and you know installing them and choices and that sort of thing. And I think we could easily do that. We could ask someone from from PV squared or or somewhere else. Yeah, they just can't be promoting their business, but they, they can certainly come and talk generally about the topic. Which brings up the question of who do we ask and when and who's going to take responsibility. I'd, I'd love to see one person take responsibility for one each of three webinars, for example. Each of one of three webinars, if that makes sense. I have, I have no problem reaching out to Northeast Solar, who put our um, RRA in. It's not a rooftop, it's a tracker, because we yeah. have we have a big piece of property um, and they've been very responsive. I have no problem reaching out to them. I, I, I'm not particularly advocating them. I know some people like PV Square or, or other places, but I'm happy to reach out to them. So, and, okay, you know, and it's a different configuration to actually have a tracker um, that, that, you know, moves. <laughs> So. Yeah, it would be interesting to have somebody talk about, you know, the ins and outs of, of which houses are, are good candidates, which houses are going to be not so good, you know, what type of what type of array, uh, different types of arrays, different, uh, it would be very interesting to hear that from somebody who knows the business. Is there somebody at Northeast Solar, you know, who is particularly knowledgeable, Don? Well, I mean, I know various pieces. I know people who or on the sales side, and I know the president of the company, and I know people who are on the technical side, because mm -hmm. uh, a tree fell and knocked three <laughs> of panels off. I, I wonder, 
with the heat pump series and the EV series, that was taken mostly from people that we'd seen give talks elsewhere or somebody new. Is there, has anybody seen a... Lori, before you go on uh, with Northeast Solar, when we did our Solarize program back in 2012, they were our chosen provider okay. for the program. So they know Amherst. Um, and I also know Greg Garrison and... You know, I would also be happy to give Greg a call. I've called on him for several things in the past, um, and he's usually pretty responsive. So, I mean, not to take that away from you, Don, but I'm happy to ask Greg. He's he's amazingly um, informative. He's a very interesting, uh, wonderful speaker too. He's very he's a very good speaker. So that's what I'm looking for. <laughs> okay, so Greg Garrison is at Northeast Solar. Northeast Solar. Yeah. Okay. And, and I can reach our, out to him. I, yeah, that would be great. So Stephanie, if you would do that and, you know, let's, let's maybe make a date for it. That'll be the, that'll be the one on, on uh, homeowners, rooftop solar. Oh, and, and, and the Northeast solar does do commercial too, uh, yeah. you know, small commercial. So, um, and Greg, I, I know Greg too. Um, he'd be wonderful on that too. So, um, See if you know, maybe too? it makes. Or yeah. maybe be, divide one evening up into two rather than having him come yeah. twice yeah you know his time is valuable yeah. i'm sure so maybe just if it's an hour have him do 20 minutes on one 20 on another yep and, and give him give him the option i don't know how long he's going to want to speak on either of these right so i would say if you want in half hour for each or 20 minutes for each that's fine if you'd rather do it in two separate sessions that's fine but yeah, yeah. if you'd reach out to him that kills two birds with one stone and it sounds like he's a known quantity so and you may ask ask his advice i mean a lot of a lot of the options are the sim are similar uh, in terms of whether you're a homeowner or a building owner <laughs> or a business or a business owner in terms of you know the basic approaches and ta you know the tax credits will be sim at least the federal tax credits will be similar. Um, uh, so it, you know I'm not sure. Maybe it makes sense to weave them together in one 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 presentation. I, I sort of leave that up to him and to some extent. Okay, so solar options for homeowners and businesses and also uh, credits and financing that are available. If he knows about that, then great. Um, I think maybe they've even done some ag. Is that too far out of the built environment? Say that again. I think they've some maybe ag. done some ag integrated projects. Or can we call that the built environment? I'm not sure about dual use, but they've probably done stuff on like barns and so forth. But maybe you want to save that for a separate topic. Like I, I thought the program that you pulled together, Duane, for the Solar Bylaw Working Group was wonderful. That was specifically on agrivoltaics. So yeah, maybe right. a sort of more condensed version of that somehow. Yeah, but I, I, you yeah, wanna... I know Northeast Solar did they do they do some work with nonprofits and because I know they put some solar up on the Brookfield Farm um uh buildings or barn because I'm on the board there and I remember that. So um they're good, they're a good choice. You're right, Stephanie. They're definitely a good choice. So homeowners, businesses, and nonprofits. So and the thing so that's what we want to ask him then, Stephanie, if you would talk about options for homeowners and businesses and nonprofits and also about credits and financing. And we'll save the ag integrated and dual use stuff maybe for Dwayne. <laughs> um yeah, or or I, I think just another or another audience, another webinar that we could think of other people. And I think maybe too as far as getting more people to come if it's maybe pitched a little bit less as a, a lecture series and more of a kind of car talk-esque q and A. I, I think people like that. I think that's fun. I think people yeah. learn from other people's yeah. good questions. Like really dead, bring your questions, bring your rooftop. All right, so we leave a lot of time, a lot of time. So I'd rather have shorter seminars with a lot of time for questions. So that's why I say when we talk to, when you talk to Greg, Stephanie, if he thinks that this is going to go an hour, then maybe ask him if he'd be willing to do two. So there's plenty of time for Q and A. Uh, and if he can't quite hack that, you know, we'll, we'll just see what he's willing to do. Um, you know, he's 
I, I might jump in and say, I don't think it's a good idea to let someone talk for an hour straight. <laughs> <laughs> so okay. Even if he wants to, that's, I'm going to, no. Okay. Okay. So let's see, what can he do in, how about half an hour? What can he do in half an hour and the other half hour is for Q&A? And it, we'll, you know, find out what he's willing to do, I think is the important thing. And then we'll, once we find out what he's willing to do and whether he is willing to do one or two sessions, we'll figure out what else we need. So why don't we start there, Stephanie, and go yep. from there. I get it. Okay. And then Dwayne, I think it might be nice if you did your, your Ag Integrated Projects um, talk sometime for, you know, for a audience in town, if, if you did it for the solar bike, if you already have one. I'm trying to think. I didn't do that. I mean, I, we organized that, but um, we had oh. some speakers. Um, oh, I see. I see. I see. Yeah. Um, and I'm trying to. I'm trying to remember if, if um, exact. We well, have to look at them again. But those recordings, I believe, it's are recorded. available. So I'm not sure if we would need to re-ask re them or just okay, um, probably not. Then. Advertise that we're going to um, show them and maybe have a cute, have a discussion about them at some future ECAC meeting. It was long. I mean, that that se separate session was long. It was a few yeah. hours. So I, you couldn't do that. Okay. You couldn't replicate that. I'm just okay. saying that there were very interesting speakers and maybe finding a way, someone who could maybe consolidate some of that information in a way that might be usable, might yeah. be helpful. How about how about we get a, a bit of a summary, but then try to find a few people to do a QA again. Just you know, short summary and then a panel of people to ask questions. I mean, we could I, I don't not sure about video editing, but we could potentially edit those videos into something that would be, you know, half an hour summary of them. Uh, and then ask truth, you know, if we could ask Jake Marley. Um uh and um was it Jesse Robertson Dubois that was uh, the other speaker? I'm trying to remember from Blue Wave. I don't, I'm trying to remember. Uh, I don't who else remember. I don't speakers. have it off the top um, of my head. Um, yeah. Uh, but um, Jake's Jake's one person that would I'd be very comfortable asking. He's local uh, um, and very involved with this. All right, Twain. But okay, let's. let's Let's I, I let's get through this first one first. <laughs> it's my <idea>. okay. <laughs> let's figure out the first one, and as soon as. But I, I don't want to put this off too long because I want to be able to do you know one every month or something like that. Say for I don't know January, February, March, something like that. Right? Is that does it sound like a reasonable timeline? Wait till after the holidays and then just hit one a month for a couple. Yesterday of months. I met a couple of people who are on the Hadley. Not sure, energy commission um kind of our counterpart and so for the ag related one it might be interesting to combine with them because i think there's yes. probably a smaller number of people interested in the ag that actually so maybe combining a um an event with their support and sponsorship would reach more more folks yeah or even sunderland and you know if we can find a few other local if there's yep. Yep. groups elsewhere yeah, there's i think this, you know, maybe the, the, hmm? yep the second one might be the community solar, because I think there'd be a lot of town residents interested. How can I take advantage of solar if I'm a renter or if my roof's not suitable? And for them, the answer is community solar. And I imagine there would be representatives from community solar companies that would be happy to come in and do a similar sort of like, here's how you could, here's how you get into community solar. You, there were some in your solar forum, Dwayne, that, um, uh, yeah, I was going to say there's, there's nuances I think we would want to cover there in terms of what type of community solar, uh, um, uh, what are the options of the different types of community solar, and how do you, how do you, um, how do you um, navigate into the type of community solar that you're um, that fits your needs best. Right. Yep. Okay, so I think what I'm hearing here is ultimately. Uh, we've got um, Stephanie is going to reach out around uh, to was it Greg about homeowners and businesses, see how much we can do there and nonprofits. 
Steve, if you can reach out to your contacts about maybe a community solar. Um, someone to I don't have any, but I could Google. <laughs> Google, yeah. Uh, does anyone have any suggestions for people to talk to about community solar? Who aren't don't who aren't going to just let me just point. I mean, the other thing about community solar is that um, you know it's not that hard. I mean, it, it 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 could use a webinar to you know how do you go find a community shared solar project and sign up to be an off taker. It it takes you know it's not you you, you can do it um, and so forth. Um, but there's also a group. There's a I suspect there's some in, interest uh, of community members in Amherst. Um, to um, think about developing their their own community shared solar project, and the and that they that they would want to you know get a hundred people together to think about a community shared solar project for for them for Amherst that they would you know want to have some uh, ability to oversee and manage and control and direct and so forth and have the. Uh, arrangement and 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 potential ownership uh or um direct off takers to low income or different populations and so so forth so that's you know th that's another opportunity is to you know see you know we're we're not community organizers in ecac but we could facilitate uh potentially facilitate uh or at least um inform folks that there's an opportunity uh to um, for community members to come together on their own, uh, and and some entities to work with um, to develop a solar project, um, a community shared solar project that that uh, they yeah. might want to see have in their own community, uh, take ownership stake in, uh, work with a developer, find a site that is um, is suitable, and so forth. Right. Then we have to. Um... Yeah, so, so that's something that local energy advocates is also, I know, interested in, and uh, the whole CCA thing, part of that down the line is apparently to try to develop yep. our own local energy sources. That's treading a little on some of the more controversial stuff, though, about, you know, where are you going to cite this? How are you going to do this? Well, if you sign up for a community shared solar project now, it's going to be a four megawatt project in the woods somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, most many of them, most of them probably. Maybe we can find a better way to do that. Well, that's organizing your own, <laughs> yeah. and and working, uh, you know, working with a a business to put it on their roof, uh, right. uh, working with uh, with the town to put it on the high school, <laughs> uh -huh. uh, uh, and so yeah, forth. It is it is an interesting idea to to specifically try to facilitate or bring the knowledge into the town of how to create community solar not in the woods and we're treading on new territory it's 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 not the it's not the easy way to go about it but um it's it's uh it's i think what there's a some interest in yeah that would be really interesting um i can think of a lot of groups that are interested in this so how do we do this how do we find the right topics to talk about and people to talk about them. I would add not not in terms of who the people are, but in terms of how do you identify the land that you would wish to build the solar on? That's going to be an interesting topic, but I would suggest that you could use the, the um, technical potential study where they have rated uh, those lands and look for those straight A parcels or parcels with A and B um, that have already been rated as suitable for solar. And that in some cases that might be forested land and some cases that would be other type of land, but it uses a well-established criteria system to weigh the different um, types of lands and ecosystem services and all that. And th there's quite a bit of acreage in Amherst and, and other communities that get that straight A rating. And somewhat depends on the scale. Maybe it has to wait to to see how much interest there is. If you're, you know, a, a, a four megawatt project, and just someone once told me that you need about four megawatts to do a substantial community shared solar project, that would be about 400 homes. Um, and that might be 
a lot to th and it doesn't have to be all homes it could be businesses obviously too um it could be that the town can actually be an off taker uh for half of it uh or up up to you get two two larger entities to take half of it uh to be to get the incentive from the state to be community shared solar um uh, but you know, but but at the same time, it, it could be a hundred kilowatt, hundred kilowatt system or two hundred kilowatt system, and just start off with uh, like you know, uh, twenty families or something or twenty households. I wonder if we can get somebody from UMass from the uh, the business school who might be interested in leading an effort like this. Somebody with know how of how to put together a a project, right, and interest in doing that sort of thing. Um, yes and no, I would say I, I, I am collaborating in this area a bit with, uh, Myla, Mila Sherman, Myla yeah, Sherman that's what I was thinking of. Mm -hmm. at Eisenberg, um, uh, um, though we haven't really had a actual project to work on yet, uh, but some proposals, um, I, we may have a colleague who's doing this type of project in, ooh. in Brooklyn, who, who maybe could speak to it. Um, I, I got to look and see specifically what they're doing, but my understanding is a part of his business is consulting for community solar in urban areas, not, not rural areas. So I'll, 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 I'll reach out to one person. See what that I would be great, Jesse. Uh, uh, <laughs> our pre, uh, pre discussed Greg Garrison um has great interest in this area uh but also some fa failed failed attempts uh which has been very frustrating in terms of, of um developing business models and legal structures for local ownership um uh i i think things are changing a bit at the state and the i and, and the ira uh, yeah, there's so much money things. available you think you think with all the incentives available right now that this would be the time to do it hmm? Okay, well, let's let's keep. We, we have some individual assignments here. People to reach out to folks. Jesse's going to reach out, and Stephanie's going to reach out. And um, is there anyone else uh, going to actually reach out at this point? Or are we going to wait for? I think we're going to wait for. Um, let's wait to see what uh, uh, Greg is willing to do from Stephanie and what Jesse comes back with, and then we'll continue this discussion in, in four weeks when we come back after Thanksgiving. Um, so this, this should stay on the schedule and hopefully we'll have something, like I say, January, February, March, something like that. I think this is, I think this is great. I think this is um, certainly very interesting to me. I've been confused about all this for a long time. Every time I look into it, I end up doing nothing. Um, <laughs> so. Um, all right, what's next? I think we're into updates, yes? Uh, I'll give anything out. I'm going back to the discussion staff updates. You want to go ahead, Stephanie? Yeah. Sure. So at the last meeting, um, we had discussed how uh, a lot of times the CARP gets referenced as being adopted by the town council. And I was saying that that language um, I don't think that they actually adopted it. So I went back and I did my deep dive on their minutes. Um, and so what happened, I'm just gonna give you a little bit of a timeline and then what the actual votes were on. So on the 21st was when, of uh, June 21st of 2021 was when Laura Drucker and I presented the CARP to the council. Um, and there was a motion made not to adopt the document the motion was made to direct the town manager to present a plan to implement um the roadmap and so that motion actually failed and that was the only motion there was a lot of discussion after it but there was basically nothing happened and they just said well bring this back to a, a future meeting. And then it came back to the council on November, I'm sorry, September 27th of 2021. Um, and basically got sort of 
uh, brought into the town manager goals. So what was actually voted on was first to acknowledge receipt of the CARP. So they didn't adopt it. They didn't approve it. They didn't accept it. That's important because people keep using this as a document that the council has, you know, said, this is our plan forward. And it wasn't. It was acknowledged receipt. <laughs> so that is something very, very different. Um, so I just wanted to make a point of noting that. Um, and that was voted 12-0. So um, then what was also voted at that same meeting on the 27th was to put this under the town manager goals, that the town manager would update the council quarterly regarding achieving the climate action goals adopted by the council in 2019. Those goals were the 2025 25% um, reduction, the 50% reduction by 2030, and carbon neutrality by 2050. So it's not about specifically the CARP, it's about how are we meeting those goals. So the CARP is a tool and part of that, but it's not, they didn't say like, we are full scale saying we want to do everything in this climate action adaptation and resilience plan. And this is not uncommon. I just want to be clear that it's not like they didn't like our plan and they didn't want to do it. They don't do this with other plans. Um, in fact, even the emergency response plan um, is, a fi is a final draft. It's not like it wasn't a, it wasn't like approved it was just basically like accepted um so I, it's a weird i i know i really struggled when i started realizing that that's what happens that you know even the select board did the same thing they hmm. they don't necessarily approve things because they don't know if they're going to want to fully 100% support everything that's in the plan so i'm just letting you know that that so that is hopefully to solve that for that mystery for everyone around the language. Um, and just in case it comes up that to be careful when we're talking about the CARP, it was, it was um, received by the council and that's really kind of it. And then, you know, the goals are the things that the town is working to address that the council adopted in 2019. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you for clarifying. That's a little bit disappointing, but I understand. <laughs> uh, all right, who's uh, uh, Jesse? Go ahead. Um, so, I like that, unanimously agreed that it was received. That's good. Um, <laughs> the good of the of the six of the sixteen quarters that have passed since then, has the town manager given any updates? Yeah, um, part of it is your annual reports are certainly one of the things that. Um, uh, gets referred to. Um, I basically, when the town manager um, does his update to the council, he often asks what's happening, and I I've been feeding information all along. And then, if you note, there's uh, the town manager's report that Laura Drucker re referred to at the last meeting and encouraged people to look at. Um, you know, so the, the accomplishments over the, and just over the past year. So, you know, that information is definitely out there and is updated. Um, I don't know that it's like a, you know, a well-packaged quarterly report, but it's, you know, the information is definitely, it's happening. I'm providing cool. information. And there's some things that Paul even had that I <laughs> didn't even really know about that I said, oh, that's great. I wasn't aware, but okay. So, you know, um, just so you're aware that that it's happening, maybe not in, I, I think it's actually, it's happening probably more frequently than quarterly. Cause I, whenever I have something, I'm always giving him information for his updates. Thanks, Stephanie. So I have more, yep. a few more things. Go ahead. Um, so I just wanted to give an update on the heat pump RFP. Um, so I, because I said that I've been kind of waiting on some follow-up. I went back through my emails and found the correspondence with Sean Mangano uh, where he had reached out to town council and what had happened, and I think I'd reported this to you a while ago, was that I was asked to provide some language about um, Amherst and our, the predominance of EJ communities within the town as a 
you know, an explanation of why we want to do this heat pump program, that it will be specifically targeted to EJ communities, because there was some question about using federal funds to purchase heat pumps by individual homeowners. So we had to first of all find out from town council, is that allowed? And then um, had to have some language around sort of a justification for this program and how we were going to market it to EJ communities primarily. So um, the follow-up was that Sean Reddit said what I wrote, said, this looks good and I will get back to you. And that's where the ball sort of fell and got dropped. So I have followed up with the person who is now taking over the ARPA funding and she has reached back out to the legal counsel um, representative at KP Law who Sean had correspondence with and has asked follow-up questions. So, um, and she also had a few suggestions for me for additions to add to the RFP based on sort of the ARPA funding piece. So I can easily throw those things in, but it's really just getting, um, I think the response from legal counsel to sort of give us the blessing that we're kind of waiting on. So um, I just wanted to give you an update that I'm not, it's not, you know, we're, we're following up. It's just, we're not getting the response that we need. So we're, we're trying to move that forward. Um, hey, thanks, Steph. Yeah. And it's my goal to try to get this RFP out. Like as soon as we hear from legal counsel, I'm going to make those edits so that I can just get it out. Um, mm -hmm. And we can start moving forward on that because I would like to really launch this program, you know, in January, February of 24. That's kind of my goal. So um, and then let's see. Oh, and then uh, Laura had sent me a link to the network geothermal opportunity. And um, unfortunately, when I researched that a little more, there was an application deadline for uh, requesting the application. The deadline was October 13th. And I I received the, the link after that date. So we kind of missed that opportunity. But realistic, honestly, I just this month, I do not have the capacity. I've got a meta grant and um, other things that I'm trying to follow up on and green communities reporting and some other various things that have to happen. So um, this month is a busy month. And I don't know that I would have had the capacity for that right now. Will there be another round of that next year? Or you don't know, I would assume so. I don't know for sure. It's really hard to say. I don't know, but, you know, certainly will be more, and again, I, we really personally, I like others to be the first, <laughs> um, you know, so I learn a lot. And also if other communities are doing stuff and I know someone from a community, it makes it easier for me to sort of just call out to them and ask, what did you do? What do I need? How can you help me do this quicker, faster or whatever? Um, so, um, yeah, so I'd hope there's going to be another opportunity. Um, so I think those are my updates for tonight. Thank you, Stephanie. You are welcome. Uh, okay, ECAC updates, anyone? Go ahead, Stella. Um, I, I meant to raise this last meeting, but it was kind of a transport heavy meeting anyway. So I just pushed it to this meeting, which is uh, a member of the public reached out to Stephanie with concerns about vehicle idling and um stephanie asked me to raise that here um i don't i don't really know what direction to take it i mean it's definitely a pet peeve of mine as well uh it seems like maybe it would be something that we could um focus on at like a town sustainability fair or um a, the block party next year or something like that just like raising awareness of like <laughs> don't idle more than five minutes it's illegal and bad um you know um i do have some perspective on it as like uh you know employee from the employee perspective of like work truck perspective <laughs> um and i'm aware that it's also kind of a a workplace rights issue um if people aren't allowed to take breaks in heated or cooled environments and don't have other options um or if they're penalized for like driving to heated or cooled places to take their breaks um and i think that's kind of a unsolved problem more generally 
um, that maybe would be an interesting systemic issue to take on at some point. Mm -hmm. um, so if anybody has thoughts or opinions on uh, ways we could take up the issue of vehicle idling, I'd definitely be happy to do that. I don't have like great ideas right now beyond, um, again, just raising it as like an educational thing at one of our events or, um, yeah, Jesse. Could, I'm just, could you, are you familiar with the law um, enough? I, I just think we, I'd love to get it in the minutes, like what the actual Massachusetts law is. Um, My understanding, you... I can re-Google it. I've looked into this before, um, so don't, well, I should Google it before I, you put me I, on I, it. Well, well, I'll I'll it, it I can just add it, you know, I, I can reference it, Jesse, if you just want to say insert here. I bet I, I can, can just. I bet I can do it. Okay, it's been interesting to hear, but it's something like five minutes. I think it's so. Five, it's a five minute. That's the law. Is five minutes. Yeah, Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter ninety, Section sixteen A. Car cannot be idling more than five minutes unless it is being serviced or it is being used to deliver or accept goods where engine assisted power is necessary. Hundred dollar fine for the first uh, uh, offense. Five hundred for subsequent. I also am unclear. I would be curious if there's like a law enforcement exemption because I've seen um, law enforcement officers doing this a lot. Um, well, it does say that if that's the temperature is, yeah, it does say that if the temperature is less than 35 Fahrenheit, then idling is allowed oh. for a period not more than. Hmm? Other than a school bus, weird. For any, it's a little weird. Anyway, yeah, there are exceptions. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, just to comment on this for a second. Um, I went through this a little bit at the college. I think some students wanted us to add some no idling signs in front of the library because a lot of students were idling in front of the library for some weird reason. Um. Amherst College is not big enough to drive to the library, but that's a separate issue. Uh, um, so we did it, but yeah, there's no, enfor like the enforcement I think is probably not non-existent. Um, and I think Stella raises some really important points about equity issues in terms of workers having a space to take breaks. Um, I mean, I think signage could potentially help. Um, but I also think, you know, of course, transitioning to electric vehicles and to Stella's point in previous meetings, making parking and charging options available for larger vehicles, I think would probably do more to help this than um, other things we could do. I also kind of think it's a place for, you know, my... My partner's German and there there's definitely more of a culture of just like public reprimanding. <laughs> uh, I think this is a case where maybe some like just, you know, not overly confrontational or like aggressive, just um, Sneak a potato social potato. contract, like public reprimanding is really effective, which is where the education comes in, because I think a lot of people don't. No, you know, like um, and in the tailpipe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe some signage could help. Yeah. In the public parks or places like that. But yeah. you know, I don't know if this is like a top tier issue. <laughs> there are so many signage things I could talk about in this town. Bicycle signage, pedestrian signage, lines on the street. <laughs> uh anyway. All right, so, so uh, uh, sorry, I just wanted to have a follow up about that. Um, so there was a we did actually do a, a campaign years ago. We did a press release. Um, we had a press event at somebody's house. Um, press, I don't even think showed up. <laughs> so um, <laughs> but we did actually uh, have signs get posted at each of the schools. So there is actually a sign, a single sign about idling at 
the high school, the middle school, and the elementary schools. Um, they are there, or they have been, at least they were there years ago. Um, it is really challenging uh, to enforce. There's some law officials who are not even aware of it. And in fact, um, the person who sort of brought this to me several years ago who wanted to do this as a campaign and kind of spearheaded the effort had gone up to a police officer because there was a vehicle that was idling and said to the officer, you know, they're idling their vehicle. It's been, you know, 10 minutes. And Legal. the officer said, you know, uh, well, I can't, you know, what can I do? And he said, this is actually a law. It's illegal. And he brought it up um, on his phone at the time and showed the officer and he said, oh, okay, then. And so he actually went and spoke, spoke to the person because um, the officer didn't know. So again, it's, it is, I think it's a very challenging one for law enforcement to enforce because they'd have to drive around to all the daycare facilities and all the parents who are dropping off their kids, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. and leave their cars. I remember one time um, a car idling where I dropped my daughter off and uh, this person, when I got in, was sitting down at a table with the car running and sitting and chatting with the daycare provider for quite some time with the car just running in the driveway and why. Mm -hmm. So it is, you know, again, I think people are, I think there's some more awareness about it, but not as much as you would think, given that it is actually illegal to do this more than five minutes. Go ahead, Dwayne. Yeah, I, um, when I was at DOER, this was a, an issue that our Clean Cities coordinator at the time, who deals with alternative transportation, was one of his big areas of um, pet peeves, I guess. Um, there is some interesting technology, more so for trucks and so forth, that allow for um, trucks to not idle, um, but have, a, uh, I guess, probably a battery of some sort to condition the van and so forth. But those are specialty cases. The, the, just in terms of aware, I, I think a lot of it is awareness and education. Uh, I guess I, just a question. I wonder if they teach that in driver's ed. <laughs> um, they don't even teach it in like, cause I have a CDL and they didn't even mention it in like my CDL training. So I did, well, I got my driver's license in Missouri where there is no driver's ed. So there wasn't. <laughs> So it's the kind of a, I don't know whether they treat you in driver's ed here, but I did get my CDL in Massachusetts and they did not mention idling um, at all. So it's like a very rigorous process and it does not mention idling. So teaching it in driver's ed is something we can probably deal with locally. We can just ask the local driving schools. I mean, isn't there just one or two driver's ed schools in Amherst at least? Yeah. We can just ask them and it might be worth writing a little letter just to the state to point out that this needs to be part of driver's ed training. I mean, I remember it astounds me that, that uh, you know, having gotten a driver's license in California years ago, there's all sorts of stuff on the California test that I never saw anything else about how to deal with bicyclists and, and pedestrians and really, you know, that you never see on the, on the uh, questions here. And I always thought that was sort of brilliant and wondered how those how all of those questions got there. And I think the answer is somebody had to ask for it. Maybe nobody's asking, maybe we should write a little letter or just lobby our, just write to our individually to our, you know, our local rep, our local um, state Senator, Joe Comerford and, and Mindy Dome and just ask them to, is there a way to get this into, into the driver's uh, ed test book? <laughs> yeah, know? I just That's think this is one of, Sorry, go ahead, Stella. Oh, that's a great idea. I thought that was a great idea, and I'd be happy to draft a letter to the local driving schools <laughs> from us, just being like, hey. Okay, cool. Why don't we just, I just that? All I wanted to say was that I also think that not to minimize a topic like this, because I feel like this is one of those things where we like, oh, it's idling. What can we do? But collectively, if you think about it, I mean, there's so much idling that's happening. And if we're really concerned about carbon emissions, I really feel like this is a this is a nut to crack because you know we've got laws in the state and they're not being enforced and it's still a problem i'm still seeing people do it all the time um you know so dropping off kids and all of that so i i really um yeah i i encourage you to sort of take a stand and follow up maybe so Stella, if you want to draft a letter go ahead ecac will sign it you know we'll see if we get a version that we can all sign and i mean i think before drafting a letter maybe just a phone call to the driver's school yeah. to ask them if it's on the curriculum um 
And maybe was, I can write a little letter, a little op-ed, you know, a little opinion piece for the local paper or something like that, just to get just to get this out there on people's minds again. This was ringing a bell, and I remember now, and I found it. I was reading it. New York City has a citizens' air complaint program, which allows citizens to report trucks that are parked and idling for more than three minutes or more than one minute if parked outside of a school. And those who report can collect 25% of any fine <laughs> against the truck. <laughs> so you got these, basically like these retired people going around surreptitiously taking pictures or videos. There's a hotline or some way they submit it. Um, and then I, I guess the city then sends it to the registered owner of the vehicle. Um, so while it while it says it's it's a hot market for videos of idling trucks, it does say that some drivers respond with fists. So oh. it's a it's a it's a bounty hunting program, not without risks. I also think like that is I've I've heard about that. I've heard about that. And that is like a huge equity issue yeah. because it is like targeting trucks specifically and like employees rather than like the employers that are like forcing people to take breaks in their trucks. Well, I think that the fines go to the employers, not the drivers, because it's based on the yeah. registration. Yeah, but like, but who knows do what they the really, or do they get do. taken out of their pay? You know. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with you. There's an equity issue there about that that break. I hadn't um, thought about that aspect before. Maybe maybe encouraging residents to spy on one another is not what we want. <laughs> Probably not. Not in Amherst. We do that enough already. <laughs> I had one little update if we're moving on to other. Go ahead. I just um, yesterday, last night, I gave a nice presentation over at the Hitchcock Center as a um, professor of Hampshire College. I, and I gave a presentation on the Massachusetts uh, decarbonization plan and clean energy climate action plans. And 13 people signed up, but I think there were about eight or nine folks there. Um, so we had a great discussion, um, and that's where I met two folks from Hadley who were involved in their um, whatever's equivalent to our Energy Climate Action Committee. And, and, and they're continuing. The Hitchcock Center will continue. They've had a series of events and will continue events. Um, so there may, there may be a partner that ECAC could work with. Uh, along with the Hitchcock Center, because I know they're very interested in fostering discussion on issues around climate action. Okay, that seems like something, maybe I'll just reach out to them and see where things are. Okay. All right, um, yeah, especially in so far as the solar, you know, in the built environment, maybe they have some ideas for how to get that to a wider audience. Anything else? If not, then let's move on. I think we're probably at, um, are we back at the beginning here? Let's see. Next ahead. meeting Wanna... agenda items. Oh, uh, so we've been saying a few of them along the way. Uh, we decided, what did we decide? We decided certainly this solar, uh, solar, uh, in the built environment or solar, how you can be involved in solar, have to come up with some sort of a name for the thing. Uh, since built environment isn't quite doing it, but that'll be the focus of a lot of it. Are you talking about the series or just the series? Discussion? Right. So that should be on the, on, we're going to continue trying to schedule that. Let's yep. keep talking about that. Um, there's the solar bylaw, which Dwayne is going to. Give us an overview of right that will take a lot of time <laughs> is there anything else what am i forgetting maybe the letter stella is going to draft a letter right yeah i'll just kind of go down that list like I'll, I'll call them and if they say they're already teaching it maybe like try to draft an op-ed i'll draft something I'll keep, and I'll keep working on the um uh, but I don't think it has to be, I think it can be an update. I'll keep working on the, um, I lost it, the uh, climate bank thing. But I think that can just be an update. If I have a letter, I'll put it, in the, uh, you know, I'll probably have something. No, maybe we should put it on because there'll probably be a, a little memo that'll go in the packet. So um, maybe that should be on there. Climate bank response update, something like that. 
by the bank response. Stella, I just want to give a supportive thumbs up for your idea about an op-ed. Yeah. I think it was somebody else's idea, but but thanks. <laughs> I think somebody else said op-ed, maybe Dwayne. Yeah. yeah, if you wanna, I don't know. And I, I think I may have said that because I'm always happy to do stuff like that. But if you wanna draft something, Stella, as long as you're drafting a letter, maybe draft a short little something for the Gazette or wherever things go nowadays. <laughs> something to send to uh, you know, local papers on idling that ECAT can sign off on. I think that'd be great. That's easy. And we can send a copy to the town council too, just so they know what we're up to. Probably worthwhile sending a copy to our local police chief or sheriff or whoever's in charge of the police department. I don't even know. Uh, Gabe Ting is the acting chief right now. What's his name? Gabe Ting, T-I-N-G, Chief Ting. Mm -hmm. You could, you know, you could get it to me and I can forward it along on behalf of the committee. Like you could send it to me, Lori, with your language or whatever, and I ju just forward it. Okay. Does that sound okay, Stella? You want to draft some sort of an all-purpose yeah. paragraph? <laughs> okay. Anything else? If not, back to public comment. And I think, is Martha still here? Yes. Martha is here. Hold on, Martha. You can go ahead and unmute. Hi. OK. I make comment on several things you've discussed here. Interesting meeting. So working backwards from the, the idling point of view, may I suggest that you also send your letter to the school superintendent send it to the um, what's her what's her name the school administrator and ask her to send it out with the parents letter that goes out weekly Ooh, because there, there is a lot of idling at the school I, I I chatted you know you might also want to talk with the sunrise club at the high school because I, I chatted with a couple of them a few months ago and kind of casually asked them about that and they said yeah the signs there but everybody just idles for a long time and and so if it went out in the parents letter uh that would be a good thing I can't think of the name of the administrator right now but but uh, she's the one to call Deb what's her name first name's Deb uh Think of it. Okay. My daughter's graduated six years ago. <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. So that so that and you might also call the triple local triple A office. Uh, Ask them about that. So one thing you learn about triple A when you live in the Washington, DC area is that they are a lobbying group for everything horrible. They want well, new roads, they want well, to spend money on roads and I don't know. The one in the one in Hadley seemed by uh, you know, they also they life. also teach they also teach a lot of driver's ed classes and mm, i don't think yes. those people are the lobbyists they're not that's true yes. okay yes. Uh, maybe okay. the local triple yeah. and also uh, to pile on martha your comment about the schools is huge because this is besides being a climate issue this is an air quality and yes. asthma yes. and yes. It, those children's lungs are vulnerable yes. so thank you for bringing that up okay so so then on to the um solar in the built environment. Um, the the rooftop solar, say for, for homeowners, I, I'm thinking that, you know, the, the way to get people interested really is the personal touch. I mean, I've seen cases where one person gets it in a neighborhood, so then several others do because of the personal interaction or, you know, if you had a pamphlet, for example, if there was some kind of a you know, an information sheet or a glossy two-page pamphlet or something about how to get information that uh, either could be distributed with the water bills to everybody or that people could use and go around their neighborhoods or whatever and encourage kind of neighborhood groups to get together and, and do it. Um, and I'm also thinking that in addition to uh, the... Um, local developers. In our case, we 
put solar panels on our roof, oh, a decade ago now, you know, when it was first becoming popular. And we did it through Sunrun where we don't own the panels, we quote, rent them, you know. And what that meant was you didn't have the high upfront cost. And uh, in 10 years, this month is the first time I have ever had to pay Eversource a bill. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's because now I've got a heat pump, so I'm using more electricity. <laughs> but uh, so that would be my suggestion uh, there that maybe investigate that option. Yeah, because uh, there I came across an interesting summary in Forbes Home about a survey that had been done of homeowners and why they either did or didn't have solar on their roof. And Laurie, I think I might have sent you the the link. Did you? If I, if I didn't, maybe I, I should. Okay. Uh, but what was interesting was that uh, for asking sort of why, if you haven't done it, why not? Well, it was uh, the high upfront cost was the biggest block. Yeah, you, you did send me that, Martha. Sorry, I actually even looked yes. at it. And I just totally yeah. forgot. And um, then uh, what were the motivations of why people would do it? One was to save money in the long term. And the other was, you know, because of climate change or because of the environment. Those were the two motivators that could be emphasized then. But the problem of the upfront costs is the big challenge. I would, I would just add to, yeah. sorry, Martha, I would just add to that. Um, you can also avoid or knock down that barrier by having good solar loans available. Yes. And, uh, and um, UMass 5, which is obviously very present in our region, is um, uh, the dominant lender in Massachusetts uh, providing solar loans. Oh, uh, that's so that's also important. something. And I'm sure um, Greg Garrison probably um, is familiar with that. Yes. But what I might suggest is looking at that Forbes home survey. And also, we did manage to get that those questions, Stephanie, into the GZA yeah. uh, 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 thing. So there should be some results. I haven't checked recently the GZA survey, but I think it came out the, the, the same result as the Forbes Home survey about the reasons people either do it or don't do it. But if you could create some kind of an information sheet that would have information, including what Dwayne just said, uh, about getting the low cost loans. Uh, and if you had a way of having somebody present something about, you know, the option to rent instead of buy panels, uh, you know, uh, I, I really think there's a very big opportunity here, but most people are hesitant because they don't have the information and they're worried about the costs. So. Yeah. Is that rental thing still available? Anyone? Know? Um, it is. I was just going to say that, you know, it's with, it really depends on the company that you're working with. And uh -huh. I, it's great. I'm glad, Martha, that you have had a positive experience, but I've had some communication with some people who have not had great experiences. So yes. I think you have to be really careful with that. Um, and mm -hmm. when we did the Solarize program, we really encouraged people to own because the long term was actually a much better bigger benefit. And um, I, th in fact, in that whole program, I think we had 200 households sign up for the program and participate and nobody leased, everybody owned their systems. So just, I'm, and I'm not saying don't, I'm just saying just, I think there has to be caveats with that. And it's not, you know, um, I'm, I'm really glad to hear that you had a positive experience. Yes, well, and also that was a decade ago, and I think things have really changed since then. Uh, you know, back back then it was kind of solar was just starting, and uh, so you know it was very different. Now there are several developers locally, and uh, and, and and so on, and there are the rebates. And, yeah, and there's a lot of misinformation too, which is what I hope we'll try to undo with these. Yes. Uh, but, but an seminars. information sheet of some kind, I think, would be very helpful. And then it could be referenced on the town website, but also then actually printed out and be available in our town library. They have a whole room where they have, you know, pamphlets about things and bulletin board. You can stick things and uh, find one somewhere. Yes. Uh, so um, let's see. I think 
Yeah, and and then uh, if you decide to do the agrivoltaics, uh, Jake Marley, I would highly recommend. I thought he gave us an excellent presentation, and he's he's local. Uh, he's passionate. He's very, very knowledgeable. And I thought he gave a very clear presentation. Yes. And then, in fact, uh, you know, he made the invitation. I actually went up to uh, Joe's farm there in, in North Hadley and saw the broccoli growing in the shade of the solar panels. It looked great. It was really thriving. Uh, so, um, you know, I, I, I'm I'm all enthused about the uh, agrivoltaics, but the permitting and uh, contracting and all still is a big hassle. And uh, in his case, he does that for somebody, um, handles it. So, yeah. Okay, well, thank you. Well, I've got to well, leave. Thank you, Martha. Thank you. <laughs> right. Yep. Bye. All right, so I think that's it for the evening. Shall we adjourn? Anything else? If not, then I will see you all. Have a good Thanksgiving. Yeah. See Happy you Thanksgiving, everyone. Yeah, absolutely. Take care. Good night. Good night.